So welcome everybody joining in for this seminar with Professor Richard Barncourt in our D4 Science a series of seminars. We are happy to have uh, Richard here for a um, highly interesting topic at the interface between scientifically looking at it and very high practical relevance, mobility of scientists over the planet. Richard actually is originally from Australia, just to have a few words. He's from the University of of uh, New South Wales, had a PhD in physics and in music fields and in psychology, and then over a couple of stations leading him over France, Paris, Humboldt University, Berlin, and so on. He came, he's now a full professor of uh, musicolo musicology, systematic musicology in, in Graz here, and uh, he has a lot of side interest in climate. So we are happy without much ado, Richard, welcome here. Happy to hear your uh, thoughts, but also since Richard approached it by way of role model, trying out such a other way of uh, international conferences to reduce the overall carbon footprint for that one. So we are highly interested to hear what you have to say, Richard. Low carbon, multi-hub global conferencing. The floor is yours. Uh, so thank you, Gottfried, for the kind introduction. Um, it's an honor to speak in this research group here in Graz. I believe there is some world-breaking research on climate happening here. And uh, I'm going to talk today about the conference that we're planning in the discipline of music psychology, uh, otherwise known as the Cognitive Sciences of Music. This conference will happen this year in July. And uh, we're planning some new innovations which are relevant for climate science. Uh, so just to introduce this conference for those who don't know what we're doing, uh, we have an international group called the International Conference on Music Perception and Cognition. And there's been a conference series, a conference happening every two years in different parts of the world since uh, 1989. And we also have a European Society of the Cognitive Sciences of Music. And we have a conference every three years, um, a major conference and other minor conferences in between. And these two cycles coincide every six years. And so that's what's happening uh, in July, the coincidence of this international series and the European society. Um, and so what we're planning for July is to have four hubs. Uh, Graz is one of four hubs, which are nominally equal for the purpose of programming and content. And the other ones are at, um, at Concordia University in Montreal at a university in La Plata, Argentina, and at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Um, so uh, we are planning to communicate in real time uh, during this conference, which means that, for example, if it's morning in Graz, then we can communicate in real time with Sydney, where it will be the evening. And if it's the morning in Sydney, they can communicate in real time with La Plata or Montreal, where it's the evening and so on. Uh, so the aim of this conference is the same as any other academic conference. First of all, we want to promote high quality research in our discipline. And we also want people to have a good time talking to each other and communicating in a, in a relaxing and fun way so that they can uh, be more creative. Because as we all know, this is what happens when you go to a conference. You, you enjoy talking to people who have similar interests and you create ideas in this way. And so somehow we have to try to maintain that while at the same time achieving a whole series of other goals. And the first one is that we would like to avoid harming other human beings, which is the, the climate aspect, which we'll go into in detail. Um, but at the same time, we can also make the conference more global because in the past, um, this conference is had two thirds participants from the same continent, simply because it's too expensive to fly from another one. Um, we can also make it easier for people to participate regardless of their financial background or their mobility. Um, we can also increase the cultural diversity of the participants. Um, we can improve the dissemination of the findings by using electronic media, uh, putting live streams and videos in the internet, and we would like to halve the emissions per person of a typical conference. Um, so taking into account all of the aspects of a conference which could cause emissions. Um, today's talk, the way I'm giving this talk right now, is similar to what we're going to do at the conference. So um, we're doing high quality one-way communication. That means you uh, can't talk to me right now, but I can talk to you. 
but after the talk finishes, we will have question time, which is a two-way communication. Um, we have a software which is called OBS, and it's used to mix my talking head with the PowerPoint, so the people who are watching this on the internet can see me talking on the side. And we also have to mix the voice with recorded sound in case there is recorded sound on the computer, which of course happens often in a music conference. Uh, and this combined stream is going to a cloud in the internet and the, the cloud idea makes it very easy for anyone in the world to access it and reduces the chance of something going wrong. Um, if you're organizing a conference, of course, you know that if just one little thing goes wrong, it can have a big effect on the running of the conference. Um, so uh, in this case today, people can write their comments into YouTube and I can answer them by talking. Uh, the only thing is that we should remember there's a time delay with YouTube uh, and the further away you are from the original signal, the bigger the time delay becomes. Um, so at the conference, we're going to live stream all of the talks uh, so that at least one other hub can see each talk in, in real time. Um, and the participants will have access to the URLs to access these talks in Moodle, which is a teaching system we use at the University of Graz. Uh, and they will agree not to share the materials uh, with other people, and we hope that the, they do that. There's always a problem with confidentiality, which is rather difficult to solve. Um, so these URLs will be available in advance and YouTube will start automatically at the start of each talk, as it did for this talk. And all of the talks are also recorded and can be watched as videos, which is sometimes useful if there's a big time difference and someone at a different conference at a different hub wants to watch the same talk on the next day. This happens in symposia, for example. Um, we also plan to have the audiences seeing each other. So as far as possible, uh, you not only see the screen, what you're watching on the PowerPoint over there, but you also see on another screen, the picture of the people at the other hub. Uh, which gives a feeling of presence. And we use a different kind of software for the two-way communication. We decided on Zoom because it gave us the best quality. Um, so why are we doing this? It's uh, to help a whole lot of people. Uh, normally at a conference, we have to think about the needs of academics. In our case, we have music and musicians and psychologists, and there are also people in the general public and professionals who benefit from the research. Um, by making this conference more global and reducing the emissions, we're also considering, first of all, academics with limited funding who could not otherwise afford the flight because the flight is often one of the most expensive parts. And also we're thinking about the future of the planet and uh, whether children in developing countries are going to have a long and fulfilling life or not. And this is um, nothing new to the people in this audience. So um, now before proceeding, I would like to emphasize that what I'm doing is actually not very original because um, you can explain all of this stuff just by looking at well-known ethical principles. And I'll take the psychologists' ethical principles because we're doing psychology, but the, of course, other disciplines have similar lists, some, for example, in biology and medicine. So what does it say in the American Psychological Association's principles? It says that uh, people should have a personal commitment and a lifelong effort to act ethically. Um, this is something I'm trying to do as an example here. Um, we should worry about uh, aspects of research that may affect the lives of others, and we should consider our professional and scientific responsibility. Uh, we should make informed judgments and tell the general public about our knowledge, uh, which is rather similar to climate communication when the general public is informed in, a, in an appropriate way about the results of climate research. Uh, we should also avoid discrimination, and that's an interesting issue because climate change is discrimination in the sense that people uh, who have dark coloured skin or happen to be female or happen to be young will tend to suffer more than other people in general on average. And so we can regard climate change as a form of discrimination which we would like to avoid. Um, and there's also an issue of justice, which of course is a central issue in climate ethics. Is it just for the rich people to produce the emissions and for the poor people to suffer the consequences? So um, I'm simply trying to respond to this uh, general guideline. And I would also like to point out that the American Psychological Association knows all about climate change. And they actually wrote very uh, detailed 
and uh, very professionally prepared work about how psychologists should reply to climate change. Uh, the only trouble with this is they don't seem to mention conferences and the frequency with which people are flying to conferences is gradually increasing all the time, just as the use of aviation in general is gradually increasing. So I think it would be a good idea uh, for the psychologists as well as every other discipline to consider these issues. Um, so I'm going to continue uh, by explaining some aspects of climate science, which I think are important for my colleagues who are coming to this conference. And I'll just do it in a way that uh, would be appropriate, for example, for this conference, which is happening at, in Graz in a few weeks, the second World Symposium on Climate Change Communication. The idea is to try to formulate things in a way which is meaningful for people uh, without getting into the technical details. So um, if people in the audience um, have suggestions to me how to do that better, or if I've made mistakes, um, please contact me. Um, so we could start off by looking at flying. Um, uh, if you look at the amount of carbon dioxide typically produced per person in an aeroplane, you might conclude that in a long haul intercontinental flight, return flight, each person is responsible for burning approximately one tonne of carbon. So, um, uh, and then we have to consider the extra emissions, the other greenhouse gases which are produced and the high altitude at which they are emitted. And uh, it's rather complicated to do that. And there are different assumptions that have to be made, but on the whole, one could estimate that the effect is about twice as much as the effect of the carbon. And in addition, um, we know that aviation on this basis is, is contributing a reasonable amount of global warming. Therefore, it is um, an interesting task to try to reduce that amount. Um, so uh, the real and serious consequences of climate change from my perspective is the effect on food supplies because um, hunger is already a serious problem with approximately 3 million children dying every year from hunger. And if the food supplies are significantly reduced in the future, in 100 years or 50 years, then we can expect the, the death toll from hunger to increase. And there are a number of reasons why climate change would increase the death toll from hunger. I just made a short list here. Uh, when seas are rising, then the agricultural soils are salinated and so they're not productive anymore to make food. If dry areas become drier, then we don't have water which we need to produce food, uh, also for other purposes, of course. Um, when the oceans become warmer and more acidic, then the fish production is affected. Uh, there's a problem with extinction of species, which also would indirectly affect food production. And uh, perhaps the most interesting point is that points like these will interact with each other in unpredictable ways, which even scientists today have trouble addressing. So um, the, we don't want to be too um, uh, frightening about this, but the, the total effect of these things could be much worse than the individual effects of the components. Um, and there are international um, conflicts that might occur because of uh, lack of food or water, there is some migration, extreme weather events and extreme heat waves, all of which would contribute to the future death toll. So I want to point out that every one of those points in the lists like this has its own death toll. And if we're going to work out the fatal consequences of climate change, we have to add those numbers together. Um, and we should also think about what is causing what, because it's not always completely clear that one action by a certain person is causing another effect in the future, right? So each of these arrows in this picture is associated with a certain uncertainty. Um, and I think there needs to be discussion about how certain or uncertain these arrows are, particularly from a legal perspective, when, for example, the fossil fuel industry is being sued um, by the city of New York. So um, the point of this slide mainly is that the deaths of future people will largely come from a combination of climate change and poverty. So if you don't have climate change, the, the rate of death due to poverty would be much less. And if there was no poverty, then there would be a very small death rate. But the two together is the serious problem. Um, so on that basis, I've done a very uh, semi-qualitative and approximate sketch of how I consider the death rate might increase over the next century. Um, at the moment, we have a, 
a very approximate death rate of 10 million per year in connection with poverty because of hunger, preventable diseases, curable diseases, um, violence and so on. Um, and presumably that, that rate will continue to go down because it's been going down for the last few decades. But at the same time, there will be deaths attributable to climate change, which are increasing. And one might uh, estimate in an order of magnitude estimate that 10 million people will be dying per year at the end of the century as a result of climate change. Um, now, people will say that's a very approximate estimate, but I don't believe it's possible to do it more exactly. And if somebody knows how you could do it more exactly, I'd be very grateful. Uh, so this is um, our problem, that um, carbon dioxide is actually killing people in the future. And um, I believe it's actually possible to estimate the, the number of people who are killed for a certain amount of carbon dioxide. I've written down the very simple calculation here. It's based on the carbon budget, which says that if we burn approximately one trillion tonnes of carbon, then the temperature of the surface of the Earth will increase by approximately two degrees. This is a well-known estimate, right? And on that basis, if we assume that one billion people die over a period of one century at a rate of 10 million per year, then those one trillion, trillion tons of coal will have caused one billion deaths, which means that there's one death per 1,000 tons. Um, so uh, we could apply that to specific industries. We could say, for example, Australian coal, because I'm Australian, I can talk about this. Uh, I'm very ashamed of our country continuing to export coal at an enormous rate. If they're exporting 400 million tonnes per year, according to my calculation, that means 300,000 people per death per year are being killed in the future. And if we just take a single aeroplane, uh, taking a one uh, long haul international flight, um, it might use up 200,000 litres of fuel. And according to this calculation, that would kill one quarter of a future person. So we need four long haul international return flights in order to cause the death of one person. Um, I would like to stress that these uh, rather shocking numbers are actually intended to be conservative because I've only considered one century uh, where, whereas in fact anthropogenic carbon dioxide is known to stay in the atmosphere for several centuries. Um, we know that there are many different effects of global warming and the discussion is often confined to only some of them. Um, I haven't even talked about tipping points, which is a very uncertain area in climate science. And, um, and there's a belief, I think, among many people in society that there will be climate engineering solutions. But what we know today about climate engineering is that they probably will not work. I mean, of course, it's a very interesting topic to do research on. Uh, so on the basis of these rather horrifying uh, estimates, uh, we would all be concerned in reducing the amount of emissions or somehow mitigating climate change. And there was an interesting paper recently where the authors calculated that the best way for individuals to reduce their contribution to climate change is first to have less children, secondly, to do without a car, third, to stop flying, and fourthly, not to eat meat. So this is based on the typical uh, person in a rich country. So these could be uh, people who are attending our conference, for example. So we're trying to approach this issue by avoiding the flying. Um, so getting back to our conference, uh, this leads us to a general question. How could we revolutionize the conference tradition, which has grown up over the past few decades and increasingly relied on uh, aviation so that people could go all over the world to one place? Um, and there seem to be two uh, basic ways of doing this. One way is to have a virtual conference where there are no emissions at all and everybody sits at home in front of their computer and there are many examples of that. Um, and the other way is to try to combine a virtual conference with a real um, traditional conference. And this is the approach that we're trying because we believe that a purely virtual conference um, is not very interesting. And in fact, personally, I would not like to participate. I would rather just read the papers. <laughs> so we, we realize that there's an important dynamic which is created by people communicating with each other. And um, 
we think that if people are partly communicating in person in a room together and partly communicating virtually with um, some computer screens that we will obtain a kind of optimal compromise. So this is what we're doing. We're having a semi-virtual conference with many hubs. Um, all talks will be to a local audience. And so even if the internet stops working, there would be a normal conference happening, right? So on that level, there's really not much risk of something going wrong. And at the same time, every talk will be live streamed to another hub. Um, and we'll have the regular things that happen at conferences. We'll have keynotes, um, one keynote per hub, which is transmitted to as many other hubs as possible, where we have maximum participation with every hub. Right. Uh, we'll have global meetings where we try to organize people in two different hubs meeting, for example, a society meeting. Uh, we'll have some presentations which are delayed because the countries are in different time zones. Um, we might even have some presenters uh, giving videos because they can't travel to any of the hubs, although we haven't specifically had any applications for that yet. It would be useful if some people occasionally could present without actually traveling to the conference. And we'll also have people who are remote observers. And so for paying a reduced fee, they can sit anywhere in the world and watch our conference happening. Uh, confidentiality, confidentiality is an interesting issue. Um, it might be possible to make the whole conference public and tell people that if you want to participate in this conference, you have to be prepared for your video to land in the internet and you will have no control over it. So I think that's actually an interesting option. But after some discussion, we decided that our conference would be confidential so that everyone can have a reasonable probability of expecting that their talk will never get into the internet. And, but, but this is a matter of trust because of course anyone can just copy something and put it in the internet if they want. So we ask everybody to sign a document or to somehow agree that they won't copy things into the internet. Um, okay. Um, now, I should tell you about timing. This is one of the most interesting problems. How do we deal with the international time differences? So we made a sketch of the 24-hour conference plan, and you can see it right here. Um, we have four hubs on the left-hand side, and on the top of the picture, we have the time relative to Greenwich Mean Time, uh, often called these days UTC, Universal Time Coordinated, or something in French, or some strange mixture of French and English. Um, so anyway, here we are in Graz in the winter and the time now is one hour ahead of UTC and in the summer it's going to be two hours ahead of UTC and there I've shown uh, our sketch of the conference plan for one 24-hour period and let's look at the box um, under 13, 14, 15, 16 on the right. Um, I should actually be pointing, to, can I point with this? <laughs> I use the mouse to point. Yes, okay. So if we look at this box over here, um, we can see that in the morning in Graz, starting at nine o'clock and ending at 1 p.m., we have a four hour slot, which can then be simultaneous with uh, La Plata in Argentina. And what? It's around the wrong, what have I done? Oh, sorry, I'll start again. Sorry, I got it wrong. So this box here is the afternoon and evening box in, in Graz starting at 3 p.m. and it stops at 7 p.m. and this is simultaneous with the morning in North and South America. So that's, a, that's an easy kind of slot where everyone is simultaneous and the people in Sydney are all sleeping. And then after that we have another one which is um, the evening in Montreal and in La Plata and that's going to correspond partly with the morning in Sydney. And then you can see immediately we have a problem because um, those people in Sydney don't want to start at eight o'clock in the morning. And that's, um, that's reasonable because they also have to work in the evening and we can't expect people to work in the evening and then get up early. I mean, it's just not going to work. And so we decided after considering this for some time that we would have some hours in the program where there is no communication. Uh, and during these times, there are special local events. So for example, uh, at 21 and 22 UTC on the top here, um, we have events happening. We have events happening in America, but nothing happening in Sydney. And so, and at 11, 11 and 12 in the morning in Sydney over here, uh, there's nothing. There's no communication with other hubs, and we have special events to put in those times. Uh, 
Um, so uh, there's also an issue with programming. Normally a conference program is just one thing, the program. Um, in this case, we have to distinguish between the global program, which includes all of the talks that can be seen on the YouTube stream, all of the events that could be in the internet, and the local program, which has additional events at each hub. Uh, so we're going to prepare the global program in um, collaboration with the hubs. And then after that, the hubs take that global program and prepare their own local program. Um, I should tell you about Symposia, which I think is an interesting aspect of this uh, plan. Normally in our conference tradition, we have a symposium where one person invites several other people to talk on a similar topic. And so there's a series of talks one after the other. And um, these people should come from different countries and continents and so on. So at this conference, we plan to have uh, videos. So one person would give a live talk in a certain location on their own research. And then that person would then chair a series of videos. And the videos will come from previous talks in the same conference at different hubs. Um, and so we have to organize the program so that the talks which happen in symposia will happen in the first half of the conference. And then in the second half of the conference, the symposia happen, which use the videos from the first half. I think this is going to work because um, before we get symposia submissions, we're going to issue a list of all abstracts which have been accepted. And so the symposia organizers can see where they can get their content from. Um, I mentioned the issue of talking after conference presentations. I think this is a very important point because it's one of the most creative parts of a conference where people ask questions and discuss. Um, anyone can read a paper in a journal, but you can only go to a conference in order to get a discussion among experts. And so we paid particular attention to this problem. Um, we had a practice conference already a few months ago in which we practiced written replies to uh, conference presentations. And so the idea was that the, the speaker would look at the written comments at the end of the talk and then respond to them verbally. And everyone would see this response happening on the live stream. And that was okay, but we had some problems. Um, we needed to have a chair in each hub that was transcribing the questions and they had some trouble with that because as soon as you write something down, it's already a summary and it's already different and it's an interpretation. And so people were a bit uncomfortable about that. So we're trying now to do this all um, with a video conferencing set up so that in, uh, after each talk, we switch from YouTube, which is a one-way communication, to Zoom, which is a two-way communication, and people can uh, talk in a Bluetooth microphone, and you can see them talking uh, because there's a stream of the whole audience. And so it will be a bit like a live communication. All right. Um, another thing that happens at conferences, which people consider very important, is the chatting during breaks. And um, often uh, supervisors will tell their students, they say, well, you know, when you go to the conference, the most important thing is you meet people during the coffee break, right? And um, so we don't want to neglect this. And we're working on technological solutions to this problem. Um, so we would like people to have the option during a coffee break to chat casually and informally to someone from another hub. Uh, where there's a different, with there's a time difference, right? And so in order to make this possible, first of all, the program has to have time slots where this communication happens. And so, um, so before the conference starts in the morning, there will be a time slot where you can talk to other people who are having a coffee break in a different location. And so there will be a break before the start of the conference and then the middle of the morning and then at the start of lunch and then before the afternoon session and in the middle of the afternoon session. There will be several breaks like this where you can talk uh, informally to people at other hubs. And we'll also uh, have a student assistant organizing meetings that are going to happen at a certain time so that people actually talk to people who they want to talk to at a certain time. And then in addition, there will be the option of organizing formal meetings in a video conferencing room. And perhaps you know that we have at the University of Graz a special video conferencing room, which we have reserved for the whole conference. And we um, encourage the other hubs to do something similar. Um, you may be wondering about peer review. Um, all of the abstracts submitted to the conferences uh, are subject to a peer review procedure. And we decided to do this centrally in Graz, although the 
hubs, the four hubs are otherwise equal, we, we have the task in Graz of doing the entire review procedure so that the standard is the same across all of the hubs. So we're doing that right now. And we also had to talk a bit about the registration fee. Um, we decided that each hub would charge their own registration fee and they would do all of the finances locally um, and that the fee should be as similar as possible. But of course, in Argentina, the standard of living is lower and the, the uh, gross domestic product per person is lower. So of course, they will have a lower registration fee as well. So um, that's the end of my talk because we need to have time for discussion. Before I finish, I would like to thank a lot of people. I have a co-organizer sitting here, Sabrina, um, who's organizing this peer review procedure and the conference management tool at the moment, which is a lot of work. Uh, my technical assistant, Niels Meyer Carlin, is sitting here. He uh, set up this camera and video link for me today. And there are there is a Another assistant, Daniel Reisinger, who's been working on this for the last few months. And Kati Pollack hasn't started yet, but I'm sure she will get into it. And then I have to um, thank the organizers of the other hubs who have been participating in a discussion about this for a long time. And for even longer, I have to thank the people on the committee of the conference series who had to respond to my different proposals, how to reduce the carbon emissions of a conference. And this actually also went for a long time and was, was rather complicated. And we also have a committee in Europe, the Music Psychology Committee of which I'm currently the president. And those people have also contributed many ideas. So um, that's the end of my talk and I look forward to your questions. So let's just uh, open the discussion question session. I have uh, already <laughs> one for myself, but I just want to ask uh, the audience if somebody um, is posing the question, we will repeat it here and, and then Richard can answer it. Any questions or comments from the audience here? So maybe I start to So have such types of conferences already been held and what is the experience with that so far? This is a very interesting question. I've been looking in the literature and I've been asking other people. I found a conference which was held in Switzerland about four or five years ago. Uh, where they did something very similar. They had a communication between uh, Canada and Switzerland um, and they uh, had um, the screen here with the PowerPoint and they had another screen showing the people in the audience. And um, I think it was quite successful and, and I was surprised that we came to similar conclusions ourselves without reading their paper. <laughs> and then I tried to contact the authors and I didn't. So obviously they stopped doing it. Um, They, they did all those things. Well, the emission reduction analysis is an interesting question. Um, so um, I think you could quite um, easily study everybody's uh, travel and you could add up the amount of emissions per person. And I think it would be quite um, unsurprising if we found out that we can halve the emissions this way, right? We're going to do that at our conference. And the paper I'm talking about, they did have data in there about counting the emissions of each person. I was just surprised that the, they didn't do it again. I mean, I thought, well, okay, now we've started, let's do that again. Uh, so there's not very much, I mean, of course, there are all kinds of virtual conferences happening, but this idea of combining virtual and real, I haven't seen very much. Okay, I've 
sorry, I left that out of my talk. Um, posters, we're going to have uh, regular posters at each location. So every hub will have a poster presentation just like a normal conference where the posters are on paper next to the coffee uh, and the registration and there'll be a special time slot where people look at the posters. Um, in addition, all of the posters will be uh, PDF files in the internet so anyone can look at them. And every time you look at a poster in the internet, uh, having the access in the confidential system, then you have the option of writing comments, right? And the author has the option of writing an answer. And then there's a third thing that we plan to do, and that is that we give every poster presenter the option of preparing a one or two minute video. And if there's a uh, and all of these videos will be available, of course, to anyone in the world. So, um, so if there's a conference, if there's a poster presentation on a particular day, early in the morning, we will start by showing the videos so that people hear about the posters in advance. And um, that's, it's not actually very international, this idea, but the, the international aspect is that any poster is in the internet, which you could do at any conference, actually. So are there more questions in the internet there? Oh, not yet. They're <laughs> still thinking about it. Yes. Yep. So I've got, it's a comment, actually, Richard, and a question first, a comment. So when, when you did this uh, motivation, uh, you had these examples of what the, what the death toll might be. And usually what I uh, see in this type of scientific literature, and my question will then be how it relates to it, is that if you don't have this um, sort of direct personal re relation between some cause and the consequence or the cause or the damage, you usually don't approach it uh, in this type of binary way, that or not, but usually the statistics like with tobacco and air quality and, uh, and, and, and let's say inferior health services and everything, you, you have sort of the concept of premature death and then you have this um, loss of life years or loss of quality life years so that you have sort of a risk management and attribution analysis scientifically just to make sure that this diffuse type of causative mechanism where you have no direct interpersonal or person to group relations that you make sure if there's a certain life expectancy and then you sort of statistically come up with like lost life years or lost quality life years and that metrics and uh, so my question is twofold so why um, did, did you look into this type of comparable metric and and if so uh, how does uh, this work, uh, what you did so far, others, what you found in literature on the premature death uh, from if you try to attribute risks and so on how that relates to uh, studies that are available for like from tobacco, drinking, drugs, inferior health services, so other sort of diffuse causative mechanisms in a way which you can use in a metric of lost life years or lost quality life years and all that. So there's, there's two questions. Why, why talk about single deaths when it would be more accurate to talk about loss of years? And the other question is about comparing these, um, these uh, death tolls with death tolls from other causes such as pollution or, or smoking. And so, so the, um, I, I of course agree that um, counting the number of quality life years is a very a much more exact way of doing this problem. And the reason why I'm not doing it here is because it's just, um, I already have so much material that it makes it even more complicated. And in some ways, I mean, I, I, there's nothing wrong with it, but in some way it makes it even more abstract. Um, I have a feeling that um, in the, the science of climate communication, climate change communication, that we need to focus on uh, messages which are very simple and direct. And um, if I defined the premature death of a future person as something like a person losing at least 10 quality life years, uh, then my results would correspond approximately in, a, in an order of magnitude estimate, which is all I can do, um, to, the, to the research using uh, life years, right? Um, so I could try and convert all of those things, but I feel like I would just produce a whole lot more numbers and and make the situation more abstract. And the other situation with smoking, for example, now smoking is very interesting because a very large number of people in developing countries are still dying prematurely because of smoking. And that's actually, the numbers are comparable with the numbers um, of people dying due to poverty, right? If you say that smoking is not due to poverty, although it might be. <laughs> um, 
Uh, and so one is tempted always to compare these things. Um, air pollution is also, according to the medical research, an enormous numbers of people are dying from air pollution. So um, I, I don't know what to say about that. I just um, would like people to keep the, the biggest numbers and the orders of magnitude in mind when making these comparisons. So, so um, that's why I'm focusing on an approximate approach. I'm not sure if I answered the question. Yes. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, will the hubs that are talking in the night at one hub uh, be presented in the day as a recorded video? This is the question. And um, so I should um, talk about the options in this case. So we've already promised that every talk which is live at one hub will always be live and virtual at another hub, right? Um, in addition, it's possible to show every talk as a recorded video at a later time and this will happen in symposia for example so if your talk is chosen to be part of a symposium then automatically it will be shown uh, real on location real and live virtual and live at another location and the third is as a video part of a symposium right now the question i think i've just been asked is whether we can guarantee a larger number of video presentations and I plan to leave that to the hub organizers because the hub organizers have to make a calculation how many rooms do they want and if they want a certain number of rooms how many time slots have they got and how they're going to fill them and, and it's not very easy to predict the result of that calculation. Yes, well, I know there are, today there are um, virtual, virtual reality technologies which are far more advanced than what we're using. Uh, so it would be, would be conceivable to have the feeling that you're actually sitting in the audience of a talk at another place and to be hearing and seeing what that person in the audience would hear and see, right? I mean, of course, this is already possible, but there's an enormous um, bandwidth necessary. And so the, the probability that something will go wrong is higher, the equipment is more expensive and so on. And so um, my feeling on this is that we should get started somewhere. So we're, we found an optimal con compromise where we have a certain feeling of reality, uh, which is probably good enough for most people. And then hopefully in the future, it will be gradually better after every few years, it will get better. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, this is. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is about the amount of face-to-face -face communication and how important that is for uh, for, for um, doing research and for planning projects and the, the personal meeting with the person who's actually physically in front of you really helps the research to happen, right? This is what you're saying. And having a meeting over dinner and talking to people in a casual way about non-research topics is an important part of motivating the research, right? Establish the, uh, the communication before and then the research happens later. And so I think my answer to this question is similar to the answer to the previous question. Uh, presumably the virtual interaction will gradually get better over years and decades. Um, and so the idea of going out to dinner with someone who's at another location may not be so crazy in 10 years time because people will, maybe they will 
actually go out for dinner and other people will go out for dinner at the same time and they'll communicate virtually over dinner. So right now it seems a bit crazy, but things are changing gradually. Every hub will have their own social organisation, but we have um, the option of trying to have some overlap in the coffee breaks, or the, where people meet spontaneously or with some organisation um, and just chat. Uh, we're going to have um, computers with two or three headphones uh, connected to each one and one microphone, and these will be in a quiet place because you have to avoid background noise. And so people can talk to each other and talk to another group of people talking to each other. This is the, the basic scenario. Yeah. Have you got some questions in the internet there? I yeah? have a question for the conference things also. Uh, if, it, if you, I mean, it's now in one half of the government lab, and uh, just from the experience, as far as you can <coughs> compare of what you think how successful and usual success now number of participants, how many uh, uh, registered speakers, um, um, finances, funding you need, more or less. So how would these metrics, if you now look at it, if you last organized other conference in the classic mentioned formats, and now you're up in a couple of months to this conference, if you compare the similar conferences, how is how is this concept so far received mm -hmm. taken up? What is obviously yeah. 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 Well, well, this um, conference tradition has certain numbers. Um, so the last time this conference happened was six years ago, uh, and it happened in Greece. And at that conference, I believe there were 400 people, 300, about the same as the number coming to Graz for this conference. Um, for this conference in July, we have about 600 people probably attending. Half of them are in Graz and, and the other half at the other places, 150 in Montreal. Uh, 100 in Argentina and 50 in Sydney or something like this. Um, and so we believe that the, we can make the numbers go up a little bit this way, but maybe not as much as we expected. But th the reason why the numbers only went up a little bit is possibly because people are unsure what this is about. And when they get used to it, maybe it will go up a lot. Maybe in three years' time, there will be suddenly a 1,000 people or more participating uh, distributed on different hubs simply because the costs will go down for each person. Yeah, I think our budget in Graz is just the same as it would be if we had a conventional conference because um, we have uh, the, wage, the wages of the assistants are a, a large amount of money because there's a lot of work that has to be done and the other stuff with booking rooms and food and um, this is the same. And so the, since the electronic services or the digital services more or less over, so that's no, no, not a big added cost. The, the added cost of the digital services is a, um, a few hundred euros for equipment or a, th a few thousand maybe. Uh, and then we have extra money for paying some people to do the work. Um, but I was lucky because I could do it because I have student assistance um, provided by the Dean's office. Um, so that's how I managed to finance it. I, I imagine that some other people in other countries don't have student assistance and then they would have to put that in their budget to work out the technological part. But on the other hand, if people copy our model, our format, it will be quite easy because they can just do what we did and after a lot of trial and error, we came up with our solution. I mean, we actually spent quite a lot of time. <laughs> I spent a lot of time making mistakes before we came to this stage, yes. Is there any other questions? So um, I would like to thank all the people watching from other places, especially those who got up in the middle of the night. And, um, and uh, if you have comments on this and you want to send it to me by email, that would be great because I said some probably outrageous things that need to be corrected. And apart from that, um, thank you to the local audience and goodbye. And my assistant will now, will now turn you off, or me off. Thank you.